Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alumni University. Uh, I'm Kristen, the Director of Constituent Engagement here at Illinois Tech, um, and we are so happy that you all could join us this evening. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. This presentation, including the chat, is being recorded, um, and the presentation will be available on our website at iit.edu in the next couple of weeks. Additionally, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to get to them at the conclusion of tonight's presentation. So to introduce our presenter, Dr. Lulu Kong is an Associate Professor of Applied Mathematics here at Illinois Tech. Her research focuses on statistical methodologies with applications in engineering. She holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Nanjing University, an MS in operations research from Georgia Tech, and a PhD also from Georgia Tech. So with that, I will turn it over to her to get started. Thank you, Kristen, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. I just want to uh, give a brief introduction about myself. Um, so I, you should be able to see the slides, okay. So uh, as uh, Christian said, uh, uh, I am an associate professor uh, in the applied math department here at IIT. Uh, I hold a, a mathematics bachelor's degree and, uh, uh, and then I, I got my PhD uh, in industrial engineering uh, from Georgia Tech. I also uh, picked up an uh, operations research degree. Um, so, um, so my training not, is not really, uh, graduate training is not really uh, in uh, applied math. Uh, rather, I, my research area uh, is in statistics and uh, optimization. So, uh, and the speaking of op optimization, actually, it is very related to uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, uh, I have two roles uh, at uh, Illinois Tech. One is uh, a researcher. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, the other role is uh, I'm an uh, uh, educator, right? So, uh, this is primarily my research area. Uh, uh, so, most important research area for my, uh, uh, I have been uh, working on is uh, statistics, okay. So um, specifically, I work in uh, Carl inference, uh, statistical design for experiments, and analysis of experiments, and uh, statistical learning, uh, uncertainty quantification, which is a very important area. Uh, and it's an interdisciplinary area across applied math, statistics, machine learning and even science and engineering. Uh, I also uh, worked uh, a lot of uh, uh, topics in Bayesian statistics. So um, uh, my secondary research interest is in optimization. So uh, I'm, I am not really an uh, uh, you know, innovative researcher in optimization. Uh, rather, the optimization I work on, most optimization problems are related to statistics uh, or machine learning. Um, but I do work on uh, occasionally uh, in applications that involve optimization. So today is uh, one such example. So uh, my primary collaborators are in uh, other uh, engineering and the science domains. Uh, specifically, I have worked with the material science uh, researchers, chemistry, uh, mechanical engineering, and the healthcare. So I hope to be able to expand my collaboration in other uh, domains such as social science or um, uh, economics or other science and engineering domain, particularly maybe medical. Um, okay, so that's about me and uh, um, so I have taught many courses uh, in uh, uh, Illinois Tech. So I joined here in 2010. So that's almost 12, 12 years ago, minus a summer. So uh, over the years, uh, I created many new courses and I renovated, uh, uh, complete changed many existing courses. But most of them uh, is in statistics. Uh, and so specifically, uh, here are some uh, 
uh, academic programs that I have uh, funded uh, and uh, now or you know uh, uh, have been running these programs for some time. So one of these one first one is the Master of Data Science. So uh, I uh, um, uh, co-founded with uh, Professor Shlomo Agam from uh, uh, Computer Science Department. So it's a joint program between our two departments. And uh, it was back in 2013. Uh, and then I've, we have been running the program together um, since then. Okay, but the last year, uh, I need to work on this new uh, undergraduate program called the uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in Data Science. Okay, so that's a new program. Uh, we just created uh, this year, actually, the program proposal was submitted to university last fall. So our trustee uh, has just approved this new program, the so last one, this one, so which is good news. So it's a uh, uh, highly uh, 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 pursued program all over the country and the uh, uh, Illinois Tech is a sort of a little bit late to the party, but uh, nonetheless, we started it, okay. So in the middle, we also created a new uh, bachelor program in statistics, okay. So that was in 2016. So I have been created all these uh, three new programs and uh, uh, being advisor to these uh, students. Um, so in the middle, we also have these co-terminal programs, you know, under the umbrella of uh, uh, Illinois attack, many uh, co-terminal programs of this uh, uh, related uh, undergraduate and uh, uh, master programs. Okay. Um, so, um, so now that's about me. So let me, uh, without further ado, so let me turn to uh, my actual talk today. Um, so let me show you. So feel free to uh, interrupt me if uh, uh, if you you need to raise questions. Okay, so um, we don't have to be formal here. Sorry, it's April twenty second. I typed the date wrong. So today's talk is about a very very practical uh, project that I did. Okay, so um, this is a very special topic for me because it's uh, it's not very technical and. Uh, uh, but it's very closely related to uh, to reality, to practice. Okay, so <laughs> although I have been working with uh, uh, various application, uh, uh, you know, practitioners of data science, but this is the by far the closest to daily uh, daily life. Uh, other science or engineering, there is still a gap to our daily life. Okay, so if you have been wondering. Uh, what can optimization do, or what kind? What can uh, applied mathematics or mathematics do? What's what's the use of mathematics? Okay, or I mean, I, I doubt you will ask the question that what is the use of data science? But you know, these are all combined, right? So here is an example. Okay, so um, so I'm the topic is a uh, fire and diverse allocation of uh, scarce resources. So this is a joint work. Uh, with uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Hadis Adahid from uh, University of Illinois at Chicago and her student. Okay, um, so um, so now let, this is the, the outline of the talk. Okay, so uh, first one I'm going to talk about uh, the motivation why we want to work on this topic. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to introduce the definition of the problem and uh, what do we want to do, okay, our angle to solve this problem. Uh, and then uh, I'm gonna detailedly explain uh, our methodology, our solution, how, how did we solve this problem? Um, so in a paper we published, uh, we uh, studied the three cities, uh, three US cities, uh, Chicago, New York, and Baltimore. Uh, but because we are in Chicago, right? So, and due to the time limit, time limit, I'm going to uh, illustrate this case study only for Chicago, okay? Um, and then I'm gonna conclude my talk, okay? So uh, now let's, let me talk about, explain why we want to work on this topic, okay? So, so this, 
this uh, this work was uh, started in uh, in the summer of uh, uh, 2020, so almost almost two years ago. Okay, so back then, if you can still remember, right? So uh, our country, U.S., and as well as the world, uh, was experiencing the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic, right? Uh, and back then, uh, there was no vaccination and there was no effective treatment, right? So, um, and uh, uh, although all those uh, big uh, pharmaceutical companies have been, uh, and other researchers have been developing, uh, working on the vaccination development, that was the situation back then. So we anticipated, and not just we, okay, so uh, most uh, people working in this uh, healthcare area and the logistics and the uh, epidemiology all recognize that this, uh, it's all common sense as well, right? So the scars of uh, uh, medical resources, right? So back then we realized all these ventilators uh, are in high demand, uh, even the limited uh, ICU units and uh, let alone the staff member, medical staff member. Uh, but the, particularly we are talking about here, we're talking about the, the effective treatment for COVID for this novel disease and the, the vaccinations, although they are not yet uh, created, okay? So uh, there is also this urgency. So we have the scarcity of these resources. And we also have this urgency, right? To distribute these medical resources, however limited they are, we need to distribute them to the most needed area and to the most needed people, right? So one big question to policymakers, right? To all different level of policymakers from White House to governor to even local area of this, uh, 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 you know, city level or even uh, county level uh, uh, policymakers, the big question is uh, how to allocate the scarce medical resources for COVID-19 relief, right? So, um, so, um, so um, I want to talk about, so this, if we ask this question, this, there's no difference uh, to ask this question for any other, for any other scenario, right? So any other scenarios, there's not much difference. But there is a particular difference for this uh, for this uh, uh, for this situation for our unique this uh, this health care crisis, right? So this unique uh, situation is the disparities. Okay, so so there's um, we have to acknowledge this, although uh, although although we don't want to, right? But it's a part of the reality. So that is the disparities. There are these significant disparities that between different population subgroups uh, in terms of uh, health, okay, underlying health, in terms of uh, uh, financial stability, uh, in terms of uh, accessibility to healthcare services, et cetera. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, uh, other uh, uh, life related uh, uh, factors that can turn out to be very risky to the pandemic. So uh, certain low income and the minority populated the communities uh, were, okay, back then were particularly vulnerable to COVID, okay. So if you were watching the news back then, so uh, uh, there was the news that uh, there is a significant uh, uh, disparity between the uh, death toll, okay, the death rate and the, the positive cases among different uh, race uh, uh, populate race groups, right? So, so to give you an example, so this is this is the COVID nineteen death characteristic for Chicago, just for Chicago residents. Uh, this data was reported uh, uh, on September fifteen, two thousand twenty, right? in the fall. So um, this is the death percentage, right? So uh, you can see that uh, uh, among all the deaths caused by COVID, uh, one third of them uh, uh, is the Latino, Latin, Latinx groups, okay? Uh, the other group, the, the highest group is Black and the non-Latinx group. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, white and non-Latinx about 20 and the rest of minorities take less. But if you compare this uh, death rate to, you know, the Chicago, to Chicago's population group, okay? So this uh, blue bar, okay, this blue bar is actually the composition of Chicago's underlying population. So we have about this many to be white and this many to be uh, African-American and this many, this blue bar, okay, to be Hispanic, okay. So if you match this to the death rate, you can see that, I mean, if uh, the death rate is evenly across all population, this orange bar, which is the death rate of, of all the uh, COVID-19 deaths, but the, they are uh, uh, African-American. So this orange bar should be more or less the same height as this blue bar, but it's not the case. So that's uh, that's uh, very obvious evidence that we have this uh, disparity between uh, between different uh, uh, subpopulation groups, and then there are many reasons for that. Okay, so we are not here to explain the reasons. We are here to include these factors into our consideration to distribute these uh, scarce uh, healthcare uh, uh, resources. Okay, so. Um, so here's so we are dealing with this allocation problem. So when vaccines or treatments uh, have been developed successfully, so in the early production stage, okay, in the early production stage, they are in very limited quantities. Okay, so I mean, I mean, because uh, they are still just uh, we are still in manufacturing mode, right? Just start to produce these uh, uh, vaccines or treatment. Uh, and there is also this financial constraint, right? So yeah, it takes a lot of effort, uh, labor, um, time and money to distribute this uh, centralized resources to different locations all over the country, right? Uh, but the, so there's a, this big gap between these available resources and the, the entire population who need them. Right, so everybody need a vaccine. Uh, well, most people need a vaccine, right? So, um, so, but the, you know, vaccines or treatment are not for everybody initially. Okay, initially, if you recall, uh, the early early months of two thousand twenty, right? So, we have to take a vaccine. We have to take a vaccine in in batches, right? In stages. So, that was the situation. So the traditional approach, if we have to allocate resources, right? So the traditional uh, uh, conventional goal is uh, to maximize ge uh, geographical uniformity only. Okay, so what does the, what does the uh, geographical uniformity only? So basically we pursue the goal that everybody will have the same chance to receive this uh, uh, vaccine, right? So uh, if you recall, okay, so what is this situation? So if you recall uh, in 2020, we received the um, emergency check, right? So the check that is distributed by uh, IRS, by the White House, that is, uh, um, there's a particular name, right? So, um, um, I forgot the, the, the act name, right? But the, we all, most adults received uh, a certain amount of checks in their bank account, right? Or, or just a check, right? So that is for everyone. Everyone got them, almost everyone, okay? Eligible everyone got them, right? So that, that is a uniformity, okay, coverage. Although person to person, they receive different amount, but almost everyone, every eligible adult got one, got a check. So that is, uh, uh, that is what they start, okay? Maximize the geographical uniformity only, okay? So we carry the entire country evenly such that every individual have the same chance to receive this vaccine, okay? But this case is not doable, it's not practical because we don't have the, uh, the amount of vaccine, the amount of resources to cover everyone, right? Some people will get it, some people will not. So this is this will lead to if we pursue this uh, geographic uh, uniformity only, okay? 
it will lead to an unfair distribution system and it will propagate this virus that is already there and it will propagate the inequality that is already there across several groups uh, of populations. So, um, but uh, of course this, this approach is, has advantages, right? Has advantages, it's fast, it's easy. And uh, I mean, imagine you have to implement this distribution system. I mean, if you want to cover this uniformity, everyone is the same. That that's very very easy to cover. Okay, to carry out to conduct. So, so that's why the emergency checks was distributed that way, right? It was distributed that way. But however, however, that's not really. Uh, really fair right because there warren buffett received the same amount of check as as i do right so how is that fair or as somebody else do right that's not fair somebody somebody don't need that check and uh, and if you recall so that's one of the reasons that uh, there's too much liquidity uh on the market and that's why the the the, the stock market uh, is shooting up or right? have a lot of bubble later on so that 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 is what this uh, traditional approach leads to. Okay, so it's not a, a ideal uh, ideal situation for for vaccination or treatment uh, distribution when they are still scarce. Okay, when they are still very few. So what we propose is that uh, we propose this uh, fairness aware uh, you know allocation scheme. So we want to combine. We cannot just consider this. Uh, geographical diversity, okay, uniformity or diversity. We also need to consider this uh, social group of fairness, right? So we need to consider this uh, disparities between different uh, social groups and uh, consider their vulnerability uh, into this uh, consideration. So that's, uh, that's our, that's our uh, uh, proposition, okay, proposition. So now it's uh, going to a little bit of technical territory, okay? So. Uh, I will try my best to make this approachable. Okay, so we I'm going to define the problem. Okay, formulate into a mathematical problem, uh, but then I have to use some mathematical notations. Okay, so I will try to do this uh, as best as I can. So, so first of all, I'm gonna consider this as a centralized uh, decision maker uh, system. Okay. Centralized means that there is a, a in, in a certain region, let's say in Chicago, okay? So we have a, a group of decision maker, they are centralized. They will make the decision on how to distribute these vaccines, okay? So, um, and the, let's say we have B units of vaccines, okay? And uh, what we need to do is to distribute these B units of vaccines to add, M centers, okay, there's a capital M represents a center, a set of centers, okay. So imagine what these centers look like, okay. So these centers can be hospitals, okay. It can be these uh, uh, clinics that we go to to take the vaccine. It can be Walgreens, it can be CV, uh, CVS, okay. So all these are considered to be centers that will receive this uh, amount of, certain amount of vaccines that are distributed and this amount of distribution, how much we distribute a certain vaccine, so how many vaccines we distribute to each center, this is the decision that we have to make. This is a centralized decision maker will have to make. So this uh, XJ, this, uh, this notation basically represent how much vaccine, how many vaccine we're gonna dispatch to this uh, J center, okay, to this uh, J's particular center. Uh, we also need to consider the coverage of this center, right? For example, this, we're gonna use ZJ as this region, okay? Uh, for example, usually we consider zip code uh, areas, okay? So in, in our case study, we use zip code. So we're gonna uh, assign the, this uh, uh, this ZJ. This J is uh, connected to this uh, center, uh, to this uh, J's center. So basically, um, this uh, uh, this center, this particular center, will cover all the population, all the residents in this ZJ area. Okay. So for example, my zip code is six zero six one six. Okay. So there is a CVS next to me. 
and uh, this CVS is covering all these residents in this zip code 60616, right? So that's the scenario. Uh, okay, so Z here, this one, uh, basically it's a random variable, not that important, but basically we use this to denote this is the popul uh, proportion of populations which uh, who live in this area, ZJ, okay? So when then we need to also consider this uh, discrete value, the sensitive variables uh, corresponding to uh, demographic and the social e uh, economic attributes, okay? Uh, each of these uh, sensitive uh, uh, attributes, okay? They are going to take a, a set of district levels, okay? So let me give you an example. Let's say if this U represent a race, okay, represent a race, then what what are the possible race I'm going to consider for Chicago? So I'm going to consider white, black, Latino, Asian, and some others, okay, uh, if they take a significant percentage or I group the rest into an others, okay. So this basically is a, uh, the possible values for race, okay? And the U2, for example, can also be the household income, right? So uh, for example, if we talk about the household income, they can be a continuous value, or if I treat them simpler, I simplify them, I will consider them as low, medium, high, right? So uh, three category of uh, uh, income. Uh, so, uh, then, okay, so all these category, they can be combined, right? So for example, this uh, uh, combine all kinds of combination of these different attributes, uh, they can lead to uh, 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 population subgroups, okay? So for example, one subgroup can be uh, low income, uh, race is black, and the female, right? So if we have gender as another attribute, so this can be uh, one particular subgroup we consider, right? Uh, and then we also need to uh, count, okay, we need the data of uh, 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 SIJ, which is the population size of this uh, social group, okay, of this uh, social group in this particular region, okay, in this particular region. Uh, so, based on this information, based on this data, then we can, uh, we basically can get this uh, proportion of a population, okay? So this uh, proportion of a population basically count how many people, what is the percentage of people in this area, ZJ, that belong to this uh, social group G, okay, GI, okay? So for example, I can ask the question, what is the percentage of a uh, uh, resident, okay, in the zip code 61616 who are low income, black and female, right? You can ask that question. Okay, so eventually uh, it's very important to count this, uh, you know, to include this uh, uh, vulnerability, okay, vulnerability of an individual to this uh, uh, COVID disease we need to consider this uh, E, okay, which is a binary, binary random variable. So uh, E equal to one is representing this individual is exposed to this infectious disease, okay? Uh, equal to zero means that it is not exposed to it, okay? So this uh, probability, okay, so this probability that the Z equal to one basically is uh, the exposure rate. Okay, exposure rate. And the given GI, so this means how much, okay, what is, the, what is the percentage, what is the percentage in this GI subpopulation that I expose to COVID? Okay, so it's basically is the exposure rate of this social group GI, okay? Uh, and the same thing, I can even add a location to here, right? So this uh, equal to one uh, given GI and the uh, ZJ, so represent what is, uh, what is the exposure rate of all the resident in this ZJ, but the, not all the resident, but the, 
the, the resident who in social group GI, but uh, also live in this area, they check, okay, what, they, what is their exposure rate? Okay, what is the chance that they expose to this virus? Okay. And the uh, uh, V is uh, the amount of resources one individual receive. Okay, V is the amount of resources. Um, okay, so so what we we, uh, we also need to introduce this uh, uh, concept called the resource per capita. Okay, so very simple to understand. Basically, uh, it is uh, the amount of resources one person receive on average. Okay. So let's say uh, uh, this is a random variable. Let's say it's not everyone is the same, but we assume they are uniformly distributed. So it means that, okay. So if I have X amount, okay, X amount of resources, okay, X amount of resources, and I need to distribute X amount of resources to Y number of people, right? To Y number of people, then on, on, on average, one person can get X divided by Y, right? So this is the resources per capita. Uh, okay, so now uh, that's some notations. Okay, based on these notations, then we need to define these uh, two different concepts, right? Remember we talked about, we want the geographic diversity plus uh, social group uh, fairness, right? So we need to, we need to first define what is what is the geographic diversity mathematically define it okay so uh, this is the definition okay geographic di uh, diversity of uh, uh, allocation of limited resources to a set of center m is uh, satisfied okay so this condition is satisfied if any center from this whole number of centers okay on average, the resources per capita, you know, of the resident in this region covered by this center, okay, is invariant with respect to the location of the groups of the population, okay. So in other words, okay, in other words, so this XJ, okay, XJ is amount of resources that I dispatch to this center, okay. So ZJ is basically the you know, sort of the uh, uh, total population, okay, represented the total population that live in this uh, region covered by this center, okay. And then, uh, well, sorry, this is the total population. This is just re represent this location, okay. So what do we what do we mean by invariance, okay? So basically, this. Uh, this uh, resource per capita, okay, so this E expectation represents resources per capita, actually it doesn't matter to this location, okay, it doesn't matter to this location. So this, this, this resources per capita and uh, this resources per capita, this overall resources per capita is the same, okay. So further translating to plain English, okay, so um, so take uh, our zip code 60616, okay? All the residents live in 60616. The resources per capita for all the residents in this area, 60616, is the same uh, to, the, to the resources per capita over the entire Chicago region, okay? Over the entire Chicago region. So if you take any place uh, from Chicago, if this diversity is achieved everywhere, okay, this resources per capita remains the same. It doesn't matter where you are from. So that's what this geographic diversity means, okay? So it's absolute value because we don't care about the sign, okay? So uh, eventually, what is, uh, uh, what, is uh, uh, what do we mean by uh, that this geographic diversity is achieved? It means that this dj, this condition, this function is always equal to zero for any location, okay, for any zip code. That's what it means, okay? So everywhere it is zero. So it means everywhere it's the same. So that's what it means. Okay, so the next one is uh, uh, social fairness, okay? So that's another consideration. So social fairness of allocation of limited resources to a set of center. Okay, so this is achieved, is satisfied if, if you take any group, any social group 
the average the resources per capita in this group, okay, is invariant with respect to the values of all these attributes, okay, of all these uh, social groups, of the groups, okay, of the population. So in other words, this resource per capita, okay, so this resource per capita, given the same exposure rate, so this is the different, okay, so let's say E equal to one, so it, it exposed to the disease, okay, it exposed to the disease. Among all these population, among all these subgroups, okay, among all these subgroups, and uh, among them, some of them are exposed to the disease, okay, some of them are exposed to the disease. So these resources, okay, so these resources to this group of people, not only they are from group G, okay, not only they are from this subgroup, but they are also exposed to the disease, okay. So this resource per capita is the same, okay, is the same to all subgroups, okay, to all subgroups as long as 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 long as they are exposed to disease, okay, they got exposed to disease. So what does this mean? Okay, so let's say we have we have a female, okay, we have a, a African American female, and we also have a a uh, 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 white uh, uh, male, okay, white male. Let's disregard the age, okay. So these two people will have the same chance, same same chance to get the same amount of vaccine on average, as long as they have very high risk or they already exposed to the disease. So that one means. So we only consider how likely you got exposed to the disease, right? We don't consider your race or gender or age uh, or income, okay, or the rest. So this is uh, how it was formulated, okay, how this was formulated. So this uh, uh, fairness is formulated into this uh, uh, absolute, absolutely of this difference, okay? Uh, it is equal to zero for all the social groups, okay, for all the subgroups. Um, then we say this fairness is achieved, okay? This fairness is achieved if this function is, uh, is the same for across all the groups, okay? All the groups. Okay, so um, these are the two conditions, okay? So the most technical uh, innovations we have done for this work is to derive, is to derive how this function is defined, okay? How this how this uh, diversity and the fairness is uh, is defined and how they can be estimated from the data, okay? How they can be estimated. Uh, we, we, I mean, eventually some of these numbers like this exposure rate within each subgroups, they have to be estimated from the data, okay? Um, okay, so now we also made the one important assumption, okay? So this assumption actually is only true for for US cities like Chicago, okay? So what is this assumption? So this assumption basically says that the chance of exposure of an individual only depends on the individual social attributes and is independent of the geographical location. Okay, so it means that, okay, so, if you are certain age, okay, and you you certain you are from certain racial group and you are from certain gender group, then your exposure rate is more or less the same, and it doesn't matter where you live. Okay, it doesn't matter where you live. I know, I know there are a lot of exceptions that this is not true. Okay, this is not true. Uh, if you count the all those uh, uh, smaller samples, okay. But the, uh, on the grand scale and the grand, uh, from the grand scale, okay, large scale, this is true. This is roughly whole. This is roughly, roughly true. Why it is roughly true? Because Chicago is a very segregated city. Okay, so this is uh, I give you the heat map of uh, how this uh, different subgroup of population lived in Chicago. Okay. So you can see that most white population is lived in this uh, highlighted red area. This is uh, Hispanic uh, communities, and this is African-American communities, okay? So if you live in a particular region, 
with a high probability, okay, with a high probability, you would belong to this population, subgroup of population, okay. Notice that this is a true, okay, this might not be true, very true to other, any other places, okay, any other places, but it's very true to some major cities, uh, particularly like Chicago, just because we, you know, various reasons are not good reasons, but the Chicago is a quite segregated city. So this can be true. Uh, okay, so if we put it simpler, okay, so this exposure rate, okay, given G and given Z uh, is the same as this group, okay, that's the exposure rate given G, okay, given G. So this is an important assumption and it simplifies our a lot of calculations and it also make possible for the data, right? So sometimes the data is not detailed enough, even though we want to estimate this exposure rate given the population, given the subgroup population, given the location, we can't, okay? Because the data didn't give us that detailed information. Okay, so um, now uh, let me uh, use one sentence to you know say our aim, okay? So what we want to do is we want to jointly minimize, okay, remember these are absolute value, they are all positive or equal to zero, right? So we want to minimize every single one of these diversity conditions and these fair, fairness conditions, we want to minimize all of them to be equal to zero, okay, right? That's the ideal case, but uh, uh, if we cannot achieve them to be zero, then we want to minim minimize all of them as small as possible, right? and uh, for any location, uh, for any uh, population subgroup, okay? So that's our aim. Uh, I will pause for a minute uh, for questions. Okay, so I will proceed then. All right, so the next one, okay? So you need to say this becomes an uh, optimization problem, right? So, so uh, Let's say uh, uh, it's a little bit technical again. Okay, so we gotta uh, define the maximum of all these groups. Okay, divergence conditions from all the locations. We're gonna define this maximum for all these uh, fairness conditions for all the subgroups of populations. Okay, so these two are basically the aux auxiliary decision variables that you know basically the upper bound. Okay, upper bound. So this is a, a very obvious multi-objective uh, optimization, okay, minimization really. So we want to minimize uh, this upper bound. Okay, so so the, if this if this is the smallest, the, of course the rest of them can only be smaller than rest of this divergence can only be smaller than the maximum, right? Same thing here. Same thing for the fairness condition as well. So we want to simultaneously minimize them, okay, minimize both of them. Uh, and uh, also this, uh, this resources, okay, so this amount of vaccines we send to each distribution center, they have to be uh, sum up equal to the total amount of uh, vaccines available, right? So B is the total number of vaccines available to be distributed to different centers, okay? So strictly speaking, of course, this actually uh, is positive, okay? So the original problem, if we don't have any re uh, uh, relax uh, relaxation, okay? So this X should be integer, right? Should be integer. Um, but, okay, but integer programming is hard, okay? And th this doesn't have to be integer, especially when B is large, okay, so then we can relax this integer programming into uh, into this uh, 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 linear programming, okay, linear. So uh, we will relax the condition saying that X has to be positive, it has to be integer. We don't want them to be strictly integer as long as they are positive and that they sum up equal to B, that's good enough for us. So another problem is this uh, multi-objective optimization. And uh, if you learn the, uh, if it's, it's quite a standard solution that uh, to handle multi-objective optimization, we can, we can transform it, not really equivalent, but we can use this weighted sum, okay? So we want to minimize both simultaneously, uh, 
but the, that's hard to do. Okay, so so what we do is we uh, minimize the weighted sum of the two. Okay, weighted sum of the two. So alpha here, alpha here, it is really uh, this uh, uh, a tuning parameter. So alpha is a number between zero and one. Okay, so if alpha equal to zero, okay, alpha equal to zero, then I'm a I only focus on diversity, okay, geographical diversity. If alpha equal to one, that means I only emphasize fairness, okay. So if alpha is between zero and one, so I'm choosing somewhere in between, okay. I'm looking for a trade-off. So uh, remember, there is also this uh, um, absolute value, right? So we are looking for absolute value. So absolute value is uh, is uh, to get rid of absolute value, usually we do is you know to discuss the positive part and the negative part of this function after removing this absolute value sign. Uh, and uh, so these are naturally the conditions because this is the upper bound, right? Okay, so this is a P2. This P2 actually is a linear programming, right? Because we, if you recall all these formulas for this, uh, f and for d, they actually are linear function in terms of x, okay, linear function in terms of x. So that's why this actually is a linear programming, okay, very easy to solve. Uh, so how do we solve it? Okay, so choose any alpha value, okay, given any alpha value, then we can solve this linear programming using any, uh, you know, standard uh, optimization algorithm, right? Um, and uh, so this is the solution for P2 for this uh, relaxed problem. So we need to round it up in back into integer. So what do we do? Okay, so we can use a heuristic rounding algorithm to change these uh, fractions of xj's into integers. And they will be approximately the solution of the optimization problem P1, the original problem. Okay. Uh, so, but there is a problem we uh, we haven't uh, mentioned. Okay, it's a feasibility uh, issue of P two. Okay, so in the ideal case, okay, remember that P one problem. So we want this dx. We want the diversity and the fairness two conditions both equal to zero. Right, that's the most ideal case. If you can find the such x that achieve this then you achieve the, the ideal optimal solution, but we usually we can't, right? So in a less ideal case, I'm gonna relax it a little bit, okay? So uh, I cannot really want it to, to be zero, exactly, that's very hard to do. Maybe I don't even have a solution that can achieve this. So I relax a little bit, okay? I will relax it, let it to be less than a threshold, okay? So this is one threshold for diversity, and this is a one threshold for uh, fairness, okay, diversity and fairness. So this uh, epsilon D and epsilon F, these are, you know, controllable values. We can control them, okay. They are parameters for this problem, okay. So they represent the acceptable, acceptable threshold for the diversity and fairness requirement, okay. So, However, the solution of P2 does not necessarily satisfy these two requirements, okay? Uh, but the, the good news is that we showed that this uh, uh, result, okay, so this is the proposition. So what exactly it says is that, okay, if there is one solution, okay, if there is one solution that satisfying this uh, diversity and the fairness requirement, meaning that they, they satisfy this inequality and they satisfy this inequality, then, okay, then there exists an alpha. I can find an alpha such that P2 is a solution, satisfy this diversity and fairness. So P2 is a solution, okay? There's a solution, there's a solution can automatically satisfy this inequality and this inequality, okay? And the vice versa. So this is if and only if condition. So if there is a such an alpha that uh, make a P2 the solution, uh, satisfy these two inequalities simultaneously, then of course there's one solution that in this region, right? In this region. 
in this uh, in uh, feasible solution. Okay, so this is a feasibility issue. Okay, so we're satisfied. Okay, we're happy that P2 is solving P2 is a safely can uh, achieve this minimum, relative minimum acceptable solutions for both for both requirement, right? Uh, and then we talk about this alpha, which is really a trade-off, okay? So this is a proposition basically representing why it is a trade-off. So if I can represent it using this, using this plot, okay? So imagine this is the fx function, okay? With respect to alpha for the same x, okay? For the same x. So this is alpha uh, and this, this is, is a feasible region. Okay? So if I change alpha value, this fx is gonna look like this, okay? So this dx is gonna look like this. And if they both of them, I, I put a two bar. So this is acceptable threshold for D. This is acceptable threshold for F, okay? I want both of them to be less, okay? Both of them to be less than this, okay? Uh, the green curve less than this, okay? Red curve less than this. So the feasible region is only this this green region, okay? This green region for alpha, okay? Gray region for alpha. So we are looking for, for example, this sweet spot where dx is also minimized and the fx is also minimized in this region, okay? In this alpha. Okay? So we're looking for this alpha that can achieve this uh, sweet spot here. And so there is an algorithm we can develop to find a such alpha. Uh, I will omit these details, okay. So now let's come back to case studies, okay. So we have used the three major uh, data set, okay, or oh, four major data set, okay. One is this population data set, okay. So it actually was contained by a Python package, US zip code. So this package contained very detailed demographical information, okay, all this uh, uh, even real estate information. Uh, and they have been constantly updated based on the documentation we read about this uh, Python package. Automatical claw, uh, crawling all this public uh, uh, government uh, sensors data. So, and then uh, for, for Chicago, our Chicago really has a very nice database. Okay, so we use the city of Chicago's COVID-19 database. And same thing for uh, New York, for Baltimore, we, they also have their respectory data re repositories we, we uh, uh, pull the data from, okay. Now, before we go to the allocation problem, uh, we, just do the, we just did a little bit analysis, okay. We did a, a little bit descriptive uh, analysis. So we want to find out what is the risk factors, okay, the population information, what are those risk factors that uh, uh, you know uh, will increase the exposure rate of people's uh, of the to the COVID. Okay, to COVID. So uh, let's say we have this high risk, median risk, and low risk, and then we did some PCA analysis uh, to show what is the significant risk factors. Okay, so you can see that the high risk uh, age. Okay, risk factors including age. Uh, sometimes gender gender is not that significant, but uh, uh, race is another, okay? So, so these are our conclusions, okay? So first of all, there are definitely notable uh, differences in contributions to COVID positive cases and even death rate across specific demographic attributes, okay? They are not even, this is for sure. Uh, and we also observe that higher, higher population, dense, okay, dense area, higher elderly population, uh, uh, more black or uh, uh, African-American or Latinos population uh, compared to other races, okay? Uh, and the low or medium income, if these factors are, you know, higher, percentage are higher, then it will increase the higher uh, COVID deaths, okay? Uh, and positive cases, so which is not surprising, okay? which is not surprising. So our analysis just confirmed this news that this 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 observation that you heard from the news. So uh, there is also this negative correlation between income and COVID cases. Okay, income and COVID cases. So lower income uh, will lead to a rise of COVID cases and deaths. 
So, um, so for Chicago, what we did is this, okay? So unfortunately, what, what, what we supposed to do is we supposed to combine all these uh, attributes together, right? So we should really decompose them into a finer group. Like uh, for example, we can combine gender, age, and the race together, right? Then we have many, many subgroups. Uh, unfortunately, our data, okay, so the COVID the, uh, death rate and the positive cases don't have that decomposition. We cannot find that fine resolution data. So we, we have to uh, study this attribute one at a time. Okay, So this is the resource allocation. Uh, we only listed the top 15 populated areas. So this is it called uh, the most populated area in Chicago. We listed them. Uh, let's consider we have 20, 200 K uh, uh, vaccines, okay? Uh, and we tried to choose alpha equal to 0.5, which is uh, what we said. Uh, we also used our algorithm to find that optimal alpha, okay? So this is, uh, this is using that algorithm. And we also compare it with, if we only pursue diversity, or if we only pursue uh, fairness, okay? So diversity means the geographical diversity, okay? So these are the different uh, amount of vaccines that we should dispatch to this uh, particular zip code center, okay? So, and this is the popu total population. So this is the ratio group, okay? So this is only based on ratio. So I can give you a comparison. For example, let's take this, uh, 60634, this is zip code, okay? Total population is over 73K. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, exposed population is relatively low. It's very low exposed population. So if, that's why, okay? So if we choose alpha, we got this dispatch, okay? If we choose tuned alpha, it's relatively low. But if we pursue diversity only, this is very high. And if we choose the fairness only, we should not even dispatch anyone, okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, the drastic, drastic difference, okay? And uh, for the same thing, we tried the age, okay? We also tried the gender, okay? Gender is not so much of a difference. So if you uh, compare these columns number, okay? All these three columns, alpha, alpha, uh, alpha different alpha and uh, diverse only. So you can see that automatic alpha is very almost equal to one means that this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, this population this this different age okay different area and uh, uh, female and the male they almost have equal exposure rate okay uh, oh, that that's the reason okay so I'm plot this uh, zip code so this is this is not a trend okay it's not a trend we just you know Put the, the decreasing number here. So this is there's a this decreasing doesn't mean anything. Okay. What we need to observe is that there's a drastic difference. So uh, this is a fire diverse. Okay. So if we use our tune, tuned alpha, and this is compared with alpha equal to 0.5, this is to pursue diversity only. So you can see some of these locations should receive very different amount of vaccines if you pursue different goals. Okay. But this is only considered race. But if you consider age, okay, this is considered age, they are very similar. Uh, they are very similar. And one of the reasons is that the, this population, this different age of population are almost the same across different regions, okay. Uh, okay, so running a little bit out of time. So we want to talk about the price of fairness. Uh, let me skip this picture, okay just tell you uh, price of fairness, okay? So what is price of fairness? Price of fairness basically is the fairness, if you, the fairness you achieved, okay? Ways of, ways or ways out, whether you consider including fairness in your, in your uh, allocation scheme, okay? So what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? What is a good uh, strategy? The good strategy is basically you want you want this uh, this gap to be both small, okay? So it means that you don't suffer fairness loss, you don't suffer diversity loss. So if you perceive diversity loan only, of course you don't suffer any diversity loss, but you suffer a lot of fairness loss, right? So if you you if you pursue fairness only, you suffer a lot of diversity loss, right? 
So, but if you use our approach, both the suffering is uh, is comparable, much smaller, right? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna conclude my talk here. Uh, so this is still very uh, academic oriented research, okay? It's very limited by the data, as I told you, okay? So in practice, actually in our practice, if you recall what happened in 2021 spring, right? So uh, our policymaker not only considered the uh, age, another important factor they consider is profession, right? So the frontline workers received the first dose vaccine uh, ahead of anyone else, right? And that's reasonable because they have a higher exposure rate. But we couldn't include that information into our study because we don't have professional profession information from this from this data. Okay, so that's the limitation. Okay, so bottom line is that it's very and it's amazing. Uh, we did a really a good job to distribute this vaccine very fast. Okay, so um, but the, uh, the 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 knowledge is that the <laughs> conclusion is that it's very easy to distribute the vaccines, right? But it's harder. It's harder to get people to convince people to receive the vaccine, to take the vaccines. So that's more difficult, which we cannot handle. So, okay, so that's all my talk. I want to thank all my collaborators and I will thank, uh, thank uh, Christina to, uh, Christine to organize the talk and uh, thank all the audience to be here. Thanks, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a great night. Oh, sorry, you uh -huh. know what? We actually have one more question. Um, right. I think you you actually answered the first two um, about uh -huh. Chicago leaders and then also who was eligible. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. But uh, we had a question that was submitted. Did you expect uh, when you first started on this that you would it would still be an issue two and a half years later, or were you envisioning a shorter timeline? Uh, actually, actually, so this is a naivety of our people, alpha people in academia. Okay. Actually, I was very amazed by our government's job. They distribute the vaccine very, very efficiently, very, very fast. So uh, to answer Ryan's question, we didn't contact any Chicago leaders. Okay? Oh. It's pure academic research. Okay, we submitted the papers, uh, I think in, in later summer or fall, okay, in fall, September. And then we they, they take forever to review and revise. So when it's published, when it's published, we don't have this issue anymore, right? But the, this uh, scar, uh, scarce uh, resource allocation, and we should include the, the include, we should not just pursue one goal, right? We should pursue other goals, especially social justice, fairness. That, that that's a, a, a message we should all still useful. It's still useful, right? Um, exactly. Right, so there is another question, is the model, is this model similar to why some people were vaccine eligible first or was that purely based on workplace exposure? Okay, good question. I think I answered that, right? So they do they do consider, uh, consider the exposure rate, the risk, right? So uh, senior people, uh, certain profession, they definitely have a higher risk than people uh, younger people and the people who constantly work from home, right? Um, so there's a submitted question back in 2020. Did you expect that vaccine quality would still be an issue? I didn't expect. <laughs> I thought it would be an issue, but uh, uh, two and a half years later, or did you envision a shorter timeline? Okay. So um, what I I I I think uh, uh, our uh, 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 Okay, so our policy didn't really distinguish uh, ratio or uh, uh, gender, right? They didn't distinguish that, which is good, okay? What they distinguish is a profession, but profession actually has a lot of a correlation with ratio income that, right? So if you consider profession, that sort of uh, cover this, uh, the other attributes that are highly correlated with them. So I, I, I know it's an issue to the vulnerability uh, to COVID, that's disparate, okay? But I think our vaccination distribution is is relative fair, is okay, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lulu. Mm -hmm. This has been yeah. absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> if there are no more questions, um, I'll just remind everyone that uh, this presentation will be available on our website in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, and we have one final Alumni University session with Professor Oscar Juarez that will be on June 8th. Um, so we hope that everyone on the call can join us then as well. So thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.